Hardy, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Hardy, your company, Cognogy, is an AI leader, not only just known in the industry, but also in the Gartner Magic Quadrant. That didn't happen overnight. What's that thumbnail origination story look like? Many years of hard work, to answer your question, but started off with very much a horizontal set of solutions in the conversational AI domain, including human resources and IT related use cases. But as I'm sure you're aware, the market's really evolved in the real opportunity in the short term, not to say that HR and IT use cases aren't important, internally facing use cases aren't important, but the Gartner views the real market opportunity as, as essentially AI agents augmenting the human agents in the contact center and in the customer experience, customer service domain. So when you look at the market opportunity, roughly half of a 40 plus billion dollar market opportunity in 2028, 2027 is being derived by AI enabled automation, which is really what we do, which is where the conversational AI market opportunity resides. When you're speaking to a senior leader in a prospect or mm -hmm. an existing customer, and perhaps they're struggling with the concept of AI, because you've obviously been working with this for a decade plus, but in terms of for most consumers, whether it be a personal consumer or a business consumer, it's really come to everybody's attention in the last 24 to 36 months. And these senior leaders are hearing things both positive and, and maybe some disturbing things as well. How do you bring them into kind of the proponent camp for you and assuage their concerns? Yeah. So that's a great question. You know, I call it the benefit and the curse of generative AI. <laughs> no one was talking about generative AI 18 months ago, maybe some really mm -hmm. deep knowledge guys, but for the, to a large extent, it wasn't sort of widely known. And, and then with the advent of chat GPT, of course, it just exploded onto the, uh, to the market, if you will. And the point really for about, from our perspective is that, you know, previous to that, the move towards more automation in the contact center was very kind of opportunistic. It wasn't a, I would call it market wide adoption trend mm -hmm. at scale. And what generative AI did, at least the, I think it opened the, in people's minds, the possibility of what could happen, what could be done to create new and very transformative customer experiences from the past. And that opening of that possibility really drove this interest in what I would call as an AI enabled automation. And then the key to this story though, for, for the listeners is that, you know, you can create amazing customer experiences with very little generative AI, but a lot of conversational AI, which is a very mature, very low risk technology, which is of course, you know, one of our core areas of domain expertise. Indeed, you bring up a good point because AI is a generalized term and it, it covers a lot of things from unstructured yeah. data to structured data, of course, and and then even robotics. I mean, we hear people like Elon Musk talking about AI and he can get rather dystopian in his commentary. And do you think that at least as we apply conversational AI in fundamentally in the contact center, that we should have a similar concern? Well, I mean, generally, depending on the enterprise, uh, you, you could try to use it as the, it's the entire solution mm -hmm. as sort of a single shot type solution, but we're not seeing enterprises doing that. Uh, it's a little early for that. The uh, large language models are still fairly immature relative to where they will be at some point in the next few years. So I don't view it as a, I don't think of it as a real risk. I'm talking about the application of conversational AI to the enterprise contact center. And there are very specific use cases of the application of generative AI where there's little or no risk as well, including the most frequently discussed one right now, which is, of course, is auto summarization, call wrap up mm -hmm. and upload to CRM, which is a really nice high value use case. And it mm -hmm. doesn't impact the customer. It doesn't face, it's not customer facing. So there's really no risk of anything you know, happening, if you want to call it that. Yeah, I think risk mitigation is a big part of assuaging people's concerns around utilizing AI, because there's a lot of misconceptions out there in terms of something that is moving into a hallucination mode and creating a bad experience. Yeah, I, I, I heard the other day, somebody was talking about the creation of the conversational AI in terms of the voice bot in their business and how fundamentally they pulled it back off of being too perfect because too perfect was almost creepy in some terms. And that just the fact that it was 
really, really good, but ultimately you could tell that it was a bot was kind of the point they were trying to hit. <laughs> do you, do, you, do you, you find that in your, like with the Cognigy bots? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, I think there is some concern that the quality of the voices and the uh, speech to text and the text to speech have gotten so good <laughs> that, you know, it's, it, it's literally lifelike. But, you know, the flip side of that is if anybody who's ha had the 1.0 bot experience would tell you that it was very robotic. And in my opinion, that lack of human-like quality was one of the things that was holding back the mm -hmm. deployment of more, more, more advanced automation solutions. So I would say from my perspective, I think that it's actually a really good thing that we're getting more lifelike, recognizing that, you know, uh, people do not want to, people want their problem solved, let's be honest. And if it can be done without having to deal with a human in, in an efficient and personalized and effortless way, we would all do that every single day. So, and as long as I felt like I was having a great experience and it wasn't, the voice was either so robotic that I reacted negatively to it or it was so human-like, I didn't realize it was a bot. There's a lot of room in the middle there where you can create some really powerful, and by the way, personalized experiences. The number of voices that are available today from all the main providers of that technology, which include the hyperscalers and a lot of niche boutique cognitive services firms are, are really driving this forward quickly. I couldn't agree with you more. You really hit it right on the head. People just want their problems solved exactly. and really where people were getting caught up in this context of human versus a digital bot lost that particular meaning that people just want to have problems solved. And at the end of the day, right. if they have their problems solved, supreme customer service your company has this construct you call a pre-trained ai agent what does yeah. that mean so you know we've obviously deployed hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of these solutions globally and from that those learnings what we've done is we've we've gone very vertical market specific and taken what are the typical common most common use cases for a vertical and made it easier, even more e or easier is probably the right term, to, to deploy by coming up with some standard snippets of code, things like that, or use cases, if you will, for that mm -hmm. particular uh, vertical. Microsoft used to have a similar type of approach long ago when they rolled out SharePoint. They knew that people would have to get their heads around it, so they created a solution accelerator, right. whether you were in the finance industry. So that's your approach yeah, of sure like getting the, the pump prime, so to speak. Yeah, but the reality of it is, of course, and this is the power of the Cognizant platform, mm -hmm. is that every enterprise is unique. And so now, do many airlines use specific uh, databases for uh, bookings? Yes. Do many enterprises use specific companies for ERP? Yes. And so those more frequently uh, used databases, we've got integrations to all of those over 100 systems of record for enterprises. And of course, then you kind of move down one level into vertical markets. And as we continue to expand and scale, uh, we're building out the integrations to those very those vertical market specific uh, integrations, like say an airline reservation system as an example of that. As, as part of your offering, you use a term called knowledge AI. And, and mm -hmm. when I think of that, I think about potentially a knowledge-based tool or repository. Is, is that what you're talking about there? Yeah, it's a customer specific knowledge base tool. It's kind of the next generation of that, I would say. Mm -hmm. And it's a vector database. And so what you're doing is feeding data from various curated data, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, from various sort, meaning you can't just, you know, throw unmanaged stuff in there. <laughs> I guess the way to say, um, but right. you know, let's, for example, FAQs is a good example. So you take mm -hmm. perhaps some PDFs, some other content, Word documents, et cetera, that sort of are uh, comprise the population of the information that you would want to have in your FAQs and you upload that into a vector vectorized database which takes all that data and and chunks it or they call it refer to it as chunking it up mm -hmm. and then that creates all these uh pointers if you will to various elements of the information that they that you need uh to be able to address faqs and so then when you leverage that in the course of deploying your your faq flow or bot um it, it enables the bot to very rapidly uh access data and based on you know the level of recognition essentially stack it stack rank it and provide the most logical answers along with the attribution of the source so mm. it's really really good from that standpoint and this is kind of the next generation of source or sorry excuse me of search and it's it's very powerful it's really cool
it accelerates it and optimizes it. Really, mm -hmm. that's what you're looking yeah. at. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. So, and again, the magic answer right now, from my perspective, well, relative to AI and naval automation, is really a combination of traditional uh, conversational AI intent based applications combined with large language models or generative AI. I would call it infusion is probably a good way to say it. And you mm -hmm. can do that in a way where, you know, you, it's a very low risk scenario and it, you're actually getting the benefits of the tech, some of the technology today without exposing the company to risks and higher costs and things like that. Because some of the technology we're doing today actually runs on, I would call it the previous version of some of the large language models. So you don't necessarily need to deploy the most recent versions, which are very expensive. And so, yeah. you know, one of the things we're always trying to do here is with automation is optimize the cost structure. Efficiency is one of the goals of automation, obviously. And you, you're, if you're spending, you know, if you're, if the cost of the automation is more than the potential labor savings of, of not eliminating humans, but uh, freeing up humans to do other things, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So we mm -hmm. have to be mindful and uh, just to be mindful about, you know, in the contact center space, you know, half of the world is, is run off of a BPO. Uh, solutions or BPLs provide half of the contact center agents in the world, I would say roughly. And that that means that there's a lot of lower cost labor out there that's being uh, leveraged. And so, you know, to, to automation has to do better than that, frankly, and or augment that in a way where it's complementary and not cost prohibitive. Just occurred to me that you really have to moderate that change, don't you? You know, it, this is a really interesting point because I think people's perception is that the, the end state of automation is the total elimination of humans, I guess, or whatever, <laughs> back to your sort of dystopian world. Correct. Um, and, you know, what we see, we don't see that. What we see right now is customers obviously wanting to be more efficient, but but as importantly, reducing the load on the agents. And as we continue to automate the, the more the simpler tasks that today are, you know, really putting a lot of burden on the contact center agents, change my password, change my address, things like that. Theoretically, automation is really well suited to handle every call that or chat that ends up coming into the contact center is a harder discuss conversation. It's, you know, my router is down and my child's papers due in two hours and, you know, it's a nightmare. The dog's loose and, you know, whatever. And so it puts a huge amount of, so what happens in the old days, of course, is agents had kind of a mix of call it lighter, um, conversations or journeys from customers easier is probably the better term and then these more difficult ones but as we continue to automate more and more the easier lower hanging fruit of the the journeys you end up with this a much more complex set of of uh journeys that that the agent has to, to solve so that means basically we, we want to bring tooling to them too that makes their even makes their ability to answer those harder questions easier and that's where the whole agent assist part of the story comes into place which is which the auto summarization of uh, post call that I talked about is, is an element of that agent assist tooling, which is a, think of it as a, a bot or a co-pilot for the agent. Right. Not unlike, you know, our customer facing our AI agents or the customer facing version of that. Right. Personally, I think that's the low hanging fruit. If you look at your cost structures of technology and people, right. You know, people are the primary cost that you have right now in a contact center or in all your customer facing people. And I think there's going to be a little bit of a sliding scale. There's going to be a point where maybe there is a meeting where those are equal. But for right now, the low hanging fruit is for the amount of money that you're putting out for your human resources. If you can make them incrementally better in terms of their performance, their mm -hmm. ability to create a better experience for the customer, it seems like that's the first place that you would start. And then the second place you would start is taking those high volume, low value interactions that you can automate more effectively yeah. with a bot. Yeah moving into those first and then going through iteration. Is that kind of how you're seeing the go to market? Yeah. Uh, what, what's interesting is the adoption strategy is really critical to success in this space. I was actually just talking to someone about this earlier today. You know, I, at one point I was in charge of a huge corporate IT transformation and we would go to the well <laughs> to present the story, but every version of the story was always, don't worry, we're going to hammer on this thing for three years or two years, two and a half years. And then in the last six months, you'll get all the benefit of this two and a half years investment. And needless to say, we got turned down like four times because we could not get value fast enough in the transformation. OK, yeah, because some people had to believe that we were actually going to pull it off. And I'm not saying they didn't trust us to do it, but it was just such a long journey that the outlay of tens of millions of dollars to solve this problem before they saw a result was not uh, 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 optimal, I guess is what I say. And hence, 
we we didn't we weren't successful at getting it approved a couple of times. It sounded um, now, good, but the the results were not going to happen on their watch, so that wasn't well. That's really exactly right. So the, and they would be blamed for it, but they would blame the other guy for it. Exactly, the old three envelope rule. So the beauty of what we're doing today, and and what, what the, the really the firms that are adopting this technology and seeing the greatest success is, they're identifying use cases that can be deployed quickly, so mm -hmm. fast time to value, which we can because of the low code tooling nature of our platform it's, and all the integrations I talked about and all that. So we can get the of the solution deployed quickly and then very high value return. So, and I used authentication or identification and verification as, a, as an obvious version of that. One of the largest insurance companies in the world, Allianz, which is public information, has, you know, they, they are a customer of, of Cognigy and they're, they are just implementing that one use case globally on 100 million calls and they're saving 90 seconds a call. So just that simple use case, but what that that's doing, of course, is it's generating a huge pot of savings that they can then plow back into or invest back into the service delivery for more use cases. Because of course, with like all insurance companies in a perfect world, they would be able to automate the claims process completely, which is a bit of a holy grail thing, obviously. And that would be on the other end of the spectrum of very complex automated use cases. If you use an airline example, for example, Lufthansa has been a customer for many, many years. They have now automated flight rebookings. And if you've used some of our friends in the U.S., if you've experienced an airline cancellation, flight cancellation in the U.S., we've all had this experience of, you know, hour-long lines and this and that where it's not an automated process. Whereas Lufthansa, because of their sort of investment in, in, in the automation over time and, and the really focusing ultimately on this really solving this complex use case, Tremendous value. I mean, I was in Germany. My flight was canceled. I got immediately three options to pick. Picked one, and it was done. It was that. It was that. I didn't have to go to an agent. I didn't have to make a phone call. I didn't have to hold. I have to wait for people to call me back. None of those normal things that we still experience today. So, the typical adoption curve, if you will, of a customer on this is starts with a high value, low risk use case, or if you want to call it quick to deploy use case, all uh, identity and verification, and then continue to move to the right of complexity over time ultimately with the goal to achieve, you know, a very high level of automation throughout the whole customer service uh, set of uh, use cases that a, a customer might have. Is that one of the successful use cases that you have out there for Cognigy yeah. or yep. is one you would cite as being something that had tremendous impact to the organization? So we've done, I mean, literally across you know, a dozen verticals, we've done all sorts of different use cases. But if you think about, okay, what are the ones I can do quickly to get some value and start moving. And this is, by the way, certain verticals, you know, may have a particular pain point. And what I always say is figure out what your pain points are and where the highest value would be for you. And it may not be economic. It may be, you know, we're putting our customers through so much trouble <laughs> because they, they, this is so painful. We didn't intend it to be that bad. So, um, so that kind of, kind of depends on the, on the vertical and the customer, but you know, just in general, three quick use cases that we see a lot of customers gravitating towards early in their adoption curve of AI enabled automation. One is this identity and verification and intent recognition. So mm -hmm. authenticate the customer, find out what they want, connect them, either solve their problem via automation or connect them with a, a, a human agent that is able to handle their problem most efficiently and hand that over to that agent fully contextualized and authenticated. That and you and I having been through this, all of us, hundreds and hundreds of times in our having to call enterprises, contact centers, know that the most frustrating thing is this, I would call it two-factor authentication, is, is, which isn't the right term you get, but it's the, I just spent five minutes punching in numbers and doing all sorts of stuff, only to be handed off to an agent who then makes me go through the same process again. And that chews up tons of time. And of course, it leads to just tremendous customer frustration. So if we, that's an easy use case. The other one that's really interesting customer facing that we see a lot of today is languages. So the ability to support multiple languages, say with an English speaking contact center. And so through a combination of obviously the Cognigy orchestration tooling, our technology, and then leveraging some of the more advanced translation tools that are on the market today, which plug into Cognigy, we can do this in real time where you can have customers speaking to us in call it any language and either voice or digital. And then we're the agent is in their native language, getting the question and they're responding in their native language. That's being translated back to the customer in their native language. And so that eliminates this need to have to have 
you know, pockets of people that speak Spanish or French or whatever, and you can literally have an entire contact center of people that speak, let's say, English, and they can respond to customers across multiple languages. And that's very appealing. The other way we see this happen is, you know, during the day, for example, maybe a an enterprise has native speaking agents during the day that are talking to native speakers, if you will. So let's say German to German. And then at night, when the German team goes home, mm -hmm. those calls, the less calls, obviously, but the calls are routed to another con supporting contact or somewhere else where say they speak English. And it's seamless from the customer standpoint. They don't realize that the calls are now being routed to a different location where perhaps the actual Asian is not a native speaker of German. It's such a paradigm shift and it's, it's a really big subject for organizations to pivot on. When I think about AI organizations, there's a lot of them that are evolving on a daily basis and coming into the marketplace, kind of like pop-up stores. And ultimately I, I look at the industry around the contact center as like three basic things, maybe four that you see like one, there's agent assist. The second thing is really a voice bot, something that you're going to encounter when you drive into the voice channel. And then the third thing is really a chat bot, something that you might have mm -hmm. on a specific touch point, like a, maybe it's a, a portal for customers or a support mm -hmm. portal. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you know, underpinning all of this really is a knowledge base that's sitting out there. And there are some companies that They'll provide one of those things or they'll provide a combination of all of them. You seem to really have the whole kit and caboodle. When, when it looks to differentiating yourself, are there like three or five things that you say, all things being equal, all of us doing similar things, we're different at Cognigy because we do these three or five things better? Uh, yeah, and multimodality. So okay. which is really important. So you have five things. your traditional kind of voice or digital ingress, if you will, customer facing. Mm -hmm. And then you also need to have, be able to support both of those paradigms on the agent side uh, via um, conversational AI or AI enabled automation. So yeah, I would say for us, it's, I, I mentioned languages, um, deployment paradigms is important. Like which hyperscale, we, we, we are, we're available in all the hyperscalers, we're available in multi-tenant SaaS, we're available in single tenant SaaS and we're available on premise. So for certain parts of the world, that's really important. The interoperability of the platform is critical. So the fact that we have all these pre-built integrations really drives the time to value, and that's a differentiator. Our Gen AI interoperability is super critical. Today, we support roughly 15 large language models, and I'll come back to why that matters in just a second. But the fact that we, we are continuously adding new integrations to the model, the ability to pick your speech to text, text to speech translation, uh, cognitive providers is, is a differentiator. And then the tooling, of course, the low code, the interface, the UI, if you will, of the product that enables developers to rapidly build these really transformative customer experiences. That's another really, really important differentiator. And then I would say the last one from my perspective is our natural, or at least of the top five or six is our, our natural language understanding engine and the quality of that, which is really tuned for this particular set of applications. So customer experience type applications. I mentioned Gen AI. Let me just take one comment on that or make, make one comment on that. The really, the other thing about the product, which is very interesting and, and cool, frankly, is you can leverage different uh, technologies at different parts of the journey. So it's not, for example, you come in and we, we can only use one large, large language model for a particular journey. We could actually pick different ones based on, you know, let's say we need to render a picture at some point in the journey. We would use a different large language model than we would perhaps for optimizing the human-like experience of the conversation. So there's a really powerful interoperability and future-proofing value proposition of the product, which again is the reason why we're ranked so highly by Gartner, because we, we really just nail this set of different criteria, which there's a lot of competitors that have, I would call it similar, they, they all play in these domains to your point, or at least mm -hmm. to a certain extent. but you know, I would argue that we do it better across more of the domains than anybody else in the market. Malleability probably is what you're talking about there more than anything. Yes, yeah, it's interoperability, flexibility, scalability, mm -hmm. enterprise quality of features, deployment flexibility, all those, and future-proofing. In my opinion, that's the checklist for an enterprise. And I would say nobody does that better than Cognitive. Lots of ethical and compliance considerations around AI. 
how do you delve into that subject and address it? Yeah. So, you know, because our core platform has natural language understanding, so conversational AI is a domain that we're involved in. On the scale of AI risk, natural language understanding is a very low risk element of the area. Where the risk would come in, of course, is by leveraging the leveraging large language models. We don't do large language models. We, you know, customers, either we or customers provide the ingress from the large language model into our orchestration platform. And of course, the let's use the term hyperscalers here. They're the ones that own the domain of the large language models and their policies for privacy, data retention or not, as the case may be, et cetera. Uh, model training, all that, that's all spelled out very clearly. And of course, you know, there's so much scrutiny in this area right now. They're all kind of bending over backwards to try to make sure that they address these issues uh, with customers. The other thing I just highlight is because of the flexibility of the platform, if you're on a zero risk tolerance on generative AI, then you don't have to use any generative AI at all with Cognig. That's the beauty of the product. You can absolutely just do traditional conversational AI, which as I said, is on the scale of risk of AI, conversational mm -hmm. AI is like a, you know, a zero, almost a, almost a zero. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the way that you described that just brought also to mind just what a shared responsibility, the ethical and compliance, sure. how that gets addressed is not just solely on your shoulders. It's really a partnership across all these different technologies. When you and I were younger, we were told in the year 2000 that people would be, you know, and at least everything that we saw in some sort of visualization, people were in silver suits and they had flying cars. And well, obviously that, that never happened, right? And thank yourself, God. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's saying the flying cars piece. Like I'm really happy about that whole piece because then we would have to have force fields for our homes um, looking at how drivers are. But if we look at the contact center world and conversational AI, you made the mention we're into this really a solid 18 months in terms of like everybody's just radical awareness of the topic. Mm -hmm. And so now we've got this next five to 10 years and you even brought up the context that we're immature really in some of our technologies, even though they're doing radically incredible things. What do you think a contact center looks like maybe in five to 10 years? It's a great question. Well, if you think about the contact center of the past and the future has a human element mm -hmm. for sure. Okay, the legacy ones, that's all it had it was a human element. It was all voice. Then we added digital, but it was predominantly a human element. And then we added a little bit of automation. So IVR, speech enable, auto tennis, all that kind of stuff. That's right. And that was, you know, 10, 15, 20% of the, the journeys. But, you know, if you fast forward five years from now, I would say you're looking at 50%, 50, 50, maybe even 60, 40 digital versus voice. I mean, part of this is demographics, obviously the more mature elements of the population <laughs> may prefer to use voice, a voice channel. Whereas perhaps our kids, they don't even, they don't even answer the phone. We know this, right? They don't like to talk on the phone, frankly. So the last thing they want to do is call a contact center. So they're going to go digital as early and as often as possible. And, you know, I, I mean, Gardner's forecasting a you know, I'm going to call it a nominal decline over time of the number of agents. I actually, you know, this is going to sound, people probably think I'm nuts. Uh, because of how um, challenging customer experience is today, the hold times and all this, in my mind, it, the perfect paradigm is a whole lot more automation and maybe even more humans <laughs> to create these really amazing experiences. Because we all know there's a direct correlation between superb customer experience and higher revenue in cohorts of co co of companies. I mean, this is all empirical data. It's not like mm -hmm. parties data. This is like the real world data. So what puzzles me sometimes, and I, and, I don't, and I have talked to many, many, many customer experience professionals over the years, they all want to deliver an amazing customer experience. So the real challenge is what's preventing them from doing that. And sometimes it's, you know, money. Sometimes it's, you know, architecture or the tech, et cetera. And so, you know, what we're doing with our technologies, we're eliminating some of those obstacles to improving the customer experience. And that's what gets me excited, uh, you know, day in and day out. I was talking about multimodality earlier. I mean, to me, a multimodal experience it, it, with a full contextual handoff to an agent and being able to have your whole issue solved in one call, that is like, for me, that's like the greatest thing of all time. It's, I mean, because it, if and when you had a customer experience where it was so amazing, you have the phone like, oh my gosh, that was incredible. That's what we're trying to do at Cognigy every single day. And we're doing it, by the way. And it is 
awesome when we do it and which we do it a lot so it's it's not that we can't do it it's just back to this point about you know what are the other tools we're working with to make it happen so but you know everyone i think in, in customer experience aspires to do what i just outlined which is give the customer the experience they want on the channel they want at the time they want and and get it done in one one shot that's that's really what we want and then some sort of follow-up to make sure that we were happy or you know do we need anything else or whatever or if i call back context we saw you just call back and you called an hour ago and you had an issue with this is there something else we need to do about that or do you want to talk to us about something else those kind of things you know are all in the domain of possibility now and it's really amazing what we can do and i'm super excited about it yeah i'm pretty excited about it too so first of all i literally do not like to call and talk to a person <laughs> i would rather be in Digital. some sort of chat flow because yep. they've gotten so good and if I need to escalate to a person, I'd rather not call them. I'd rather just chat with them because I can multitask more. This is what my thought is. You said 60, 40, I think it's going to go to 70, 30. Yeah. My, I mean, I am not married to a, a ratio, but it's... yeah, no, I, I, know you, I know you're not. I mean, I think that you're being kind of, I think the big concern for people is, well, what's going to happen for people. I really believe that people are going to have a better life. And I think that fundamentally the big blocker inside of an organization, and this is what has to change. Like, I don't think it's technology and I don't think it's a uh, customer behavior. Customer behavior is naturally changing. It has changed dramatically in the last 36 mm -hmm. months. What has to change is the command and control structure inside of businesses, because people don't all necessarily need to be in the contact center. Maybe some of those really, really exemplary people should be in sales, or maybe mm -hmm. they should be in business development, or maybe working on the professional services team where there's much more of a direct customer interface that needs to be very curated and coaching and bespoke. But, but all the other stuff can change. And I think it will change. The economics will force it to change. So I think that there's almost like a, you know, a stoic mindset around that nature manages itself and that nature will be to push people into other areas of the business. And I think it's going to improve how businesses function, but we've got to break down the walls of the command and control structure. Yeah. I mean, what we're doing today was sort of possible before, but it was super painful and required a huge <laughs> investment of services to get there. And then if, if you did the slightest, you know, tweak it, you broke it. So the stuff we're doing today is easy to deploy, incredibly powerful, obviously leveraging all this advance and compute availability, cloud, et cetera. And so, I, I mean, and, and I will say it recently, I just re recently saw some sort of surveying on, on agents. The agents are loving this stuff in general. Oh, yeah. Once they get past this view that this is an existential threat and they understand that this is designed to make their life easier, they are embracing the technology. If you think about call wrap up, auto summarization, call wrap up alone, I mean, who wants to sit there and type up notes for three minutes? You know, I mean, it's really kind of lost time. So the ability to have that, you know, done for you and then you're doing what you just said, sort of command and control of your own little world, then I think it's an, an amazing opportunity. Hardy, you're a super pro. Thanks for being on the show. It's great. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.